Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Simon Steele. I'm the Deputy Director at the Carl Sagan Center for Research at the SETI Institute, and welcome to June's SETI Talks. Uh, this is a, an interesting one uh, for me, although I, I, I'm a galactic astronomer rather than anything to do with the solar system, but the first grown-up science fiction story I ever read was in 1973. It was called Rendezvous with Rama. I can see some smiles from the, from the panelists. Um, and this was about a giant cylinder um, that appeared out of nowhere from interstellar space and uh, uh, cruised through the solar system. Turns out it was just refueling from the sun. Um, this was a, a large uh, 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 artificial uh, object uh, built by an advanced alien civilization. Um, interestingly, then in 2017, um, this, this, uh, this image was reignited with the appearance of a Muamua, um, which is another interstellar visitor that appeared and started moving through our solar system. So the question is, is truth stranger than fiction? And what are the possible relationships between these two ideas? Um, and we're here to hear a little bit more about the truth um, behind the Oumuamua uh, visitor. Uh, we're very happy to have Jennifer Bergner and Olivier Hainor joining us today. Um, and I will pass on the discussion to our resident senior astronomer, Franck Marchis. Welcome, everyone. Uh, good to see you. Thank you, Simon. Welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, it's great to be able to talk about Oumuamua um, seven years after, six years after his discovery. Um, in fact, uh, for this, we invited uh, Jenny Berkner. Jenny is an assistant professor in the chemistry department at UC Berkeley. She received a PhD from um, Harvard University in 2019, followed by a NASA Saigon postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Chicago. Uh, today, our research focuses mostly on understanding volatile chemistry, and that's going to be a very important part of this discussion uh, for planets, formation, regions, and so on. Um, hello, Jenny, how are you? Doing great, happy to be here. So you, where you are calling us from, by the way? I'm in the DC area today, but my home base is Berkeley. All right. And um, with us, we have Olivier. No, Olivier, how are you? Hey, Frank, long time, all fine. All good. Uh, Olivier is an astronomer at the European Southern Observatory, ESO. He works on the integration of the upcoming Extremely Large Telescope, uh, specifically on the science operation. Uh, he did his PhD at the University de Liège in Belgium on icy body in the solar system and a postdoc at the Institute for Astronomy at, in Hawaii. He has worked at ESO La Silla for several years, and he was even my boss, I must confess, a long, long time ago in 1996, the other century. <laughs> and uh, today his research focuses mostly on minor bodies in the solar system, um, especially surface properties and cometary activity. So let's first set, put the, set the stage. Olivier, could you please um, give us a bit an, an overview of what we know about Oumuamua so far? Okay, let me try and share. Can you please quickly confirm that it's working? Yep. Okay, well, it all started with this image, the PANSTAR telescope. It's a fairly small telescope on Mauna Kea. It's surveying the whole sky night after night, discovering everything that's moving. And you see in the middle of the circle, there is a smudge that's something moving. And immediately it was detected and followed up and it became quickly evident that there was something really weird with that object. If you look at the orbit, you have the, the solar system and you see here the path of the object. In the zoom, you see that it had already passed the sun and the earth when it was discovered. Uh, in October two, 2017. So what is really weird with this, ob with this orbit, it's, it is hyperbolic, which means it's coming from infinity, passing through the sun, to the solar system, and then going to infinity in another direction. So what was it? 
let, let me just show you just to put things in perspective. So this is a top view of the solar system. You see the planets, you know, planets, big, round. Then you see the asteroids, which are typically between Mars and Jupiter on fairly circular orbits. And asteroids are rocks, big rocks, small rocks, but essentially it's rocks. And then we have comets, and comets are on much more elongated orbits. Some of them, like the one of Comet Halley, goes quite far out, but they are still turning around the sun. And the other thing that makes them different is that they are made of ice. And so when they come close to the sun, they the ice sublimates, forming a tail. You see it close up, you see here uh, from a distance, uh, amazing giant tail for the comets. So Oumuamua is in on, a, on a hyperbolic orbit. And so the first question is, what is it? So this is the deepest image we got on Oumuamua. Uh, you see the dot at the center is the object. All these lines of dots are stars that are passing by. As we take exposures, then we sum the exposure that makes these little dots. And this image is several nights of the Very Large Telescope plus Gemini. So it's the biggest telescope for the, the longest time. What you see is a dot. So definitely no trace of dust. We, we looked really hard to see for, for dust. We did not see anything. So it looks like a rock. If, we, if you look at the, the brightness, the magnitude of the object over time, you see that it varies dramatically. And it varies by two and a half magnitude. That's huge. That's a, a brightness variation of a factor of 10. And so that means that if you look at it from the big side and then from the small side, there is a variation of the order of 10 to 1, maybe, let's say, from 5 to 1 to 15 to 1. So it's extremely elongated. What we do not know if it's a cigar or if it's a pancake. The only thing we know is that it has a very large side and a very small side and that there is a huge ratio between the two of them. We also know that the surface of the object is reddish, red. So much redder than any other asteroid that we know of. So super, super weird object. That was not the end of the story. As we were following it, and we had only a few weeks to follow it, we saw that the orbit was misbehaving. And if you look at the end of the orbit, we would expect it on this pink orbit, and the observed orbit was a little bit further out. So that means that the pull of the sun did not break it, did not uh, make it go, did not make it slow down as much as we expected. Something was pushing Oumuamua. So this is just a list of all the hypotheses that we checked and rejected. And the only hypothesis that survived was cometary activity, which has this, the right direction, the right uh, shape, uh, one over a distance to the square. And that was over the right distance. So we tried to model Oumuamua like a comet, and uh, it kind of works. Let's put it that way. It would have been a weirdish comet, but still, when we stopped observing it, a, something like a comet was the best explanation. So this is the image. This is a, a drawing. This is how we imagine that Oumuamua would be an elongated cigar thingy with a very, very tenuous push of gas. And then uh, that's all we could do. And fortunately, someone else continued the story. Thank you, Olivier. Good introduction. So it could be a cometary activity that push 
the space, the, <laughs> the, the body, but we did not see this activity. So that was kind of a mystery. And then comes uh, Jenny. So Jenny, you published a paper in Nature a few uh, weeks ago, if I remember. I read it and I really love this paper. So please tell us about your research. Yeah, so I want to sort of pick up the story where Oli left off. Um, so it seemed sort of like outgassing was one of the most reasonable explanations for the peculiar behavior um, of Oumuamua. So our next task is to try to figure out what it's outgassing and how to reconcile that with the other constraints on the properties of the body. So to sort of set the stage, there was a lot of work done trying to explain an outgassing-like mechanism on a muamua over the past several years. And so some of the candidates that came up in the literature I've just listed here on the left, the first major problem is that telescopes went looking for gases coming off of a muamua, and they couldn't find any sort of usual suspects that had carbon in them. So this sort of ruled out that CO2 or CO could be pushing the comet. The other big constraint that we have is an energetic constraint. So when comets are outgassing, they're basically receiving energy from solar radiation. And this energy causes molecules to sublimate off of the surface of the comet and gives it the push in the kind of direction away from the sun. But in Oumuamua's case, based on the amount of energy it was receiving from the sun, you actually can't sublimate heavy molecules like water fast enough to push the comet. And so we can also cross water off of our list. So this leaves a sort of unusual um, handful of molecules left that we don't typically think of as being major drivers of comet outgassing. Um, but nonetheless, these lighter volatiles like hydrogen or nitrogen do fit with the energy budget and the spectroscopic constraints that are allowed. So there were some ideas proposed in the literature for how you could basically have a body that stored enough of molecular hydrogen or molecular nitrogen to explain the non-gravitational acceleration. Um, and there are some very interesting creative ideas, but ultimately, these objects like hydrogen icebergs or nitrogen icebergs, it's really difficult to explain how they might form in the first place. And if they do form, the occurrence rates would be basically so low that it would be really surprising if one of these things was the first interstellar thing that ever came into our solar system. So um, what me and my co-author, Daryl Seligman, sort of set out to do was to come up with an explanation that would take advantage of the fact that energetically something like molecular hydrogen is a really compelling explanation, but to try to figure out a more physically realistic way to build up enough hydrogen to power this non-gravitational acceleration. So this is just a schematic of the framework that we came up with. The idea is that Oumuamua starts um, kind of similar to um, what we think solar system comets are like in a lot of ways. There's evidence that comets are made up of water, not in a crystalline ice form, but in what we call an amorphous ice. And so this means that the water molecules are not sort of packed together in an ordered way. They're stuck together sort of at random. And you have these sort of pockets of empty space within the structure of the water ice. So we think this is true for solar system comets. Then if you took an object like this and you sent it through the interstellar medium, it's basically getting cooked by radiation as it goes through its journey. So you have things like cosmic rays that can break water molecules apart and form molecular hydrogen. And because of this porous structure of the water ice, you can actually trap hydrogen in these pockets um, and store it as the body is going through its journey. So Oumuamua then enters the solar system, and as it approaches the sun, it's getting warmed up a little. And this actually gives the water molecules enough energy to rearrange into a compact, more ordered structure. And in the process, you sort of lose the hiding spaces where molecular hydrogen was being stored. So the hydrogen gets kind of squeezed out of the structure of the ice itself, and this can give you this little additional push um, in the direction away from the sun that we saw as a muamua was leaving the solar system. So this is the sort of conceptual framework. We also want to see quantitatively, does this add up? 
Um, so the first thing we need to check is, is there enough hydrogen actually stored in the body to power this non-gravitational acceleration? And this actually turns out to be a really difficult question to answer for Oumuamua because we know so little about its basic properties, like its density and its composition. Um, so we took a sort of agnostic approach and we tried to just model a realistic range of possibilities for what Oumuamua could look like. So don't look at this in detail, but this is just showing that we explored a lot of parameter space to see whether there would be enough hydrogen in the body. And for large regions of parameter space, it turns out that there is. And then the other piece that we need is to know whether a muamua can actually be warmed up enough to have the water structure rearrange and squeeze out the hydrogen. And so we did some thermal modeling and it turns out that this is true also. So the sort of takeaway is that with this model, we can explain Oumuamua's strange behavior if it started its journey similar to a water-rich comet. And we don't need to invoke any sort of exotic physics or chemistry to do it. This is all processes that we think should be going on anyways in icy bodies that are exposed to radiation. Thank you. Wow. So, so in short, this modeling that you described, Jenny, is can explain this deflection that we have seen, this non-gravitational motion. And this is due to the fact that Oumuamua is a small body. And that's something that I want many people to understand. We are talking about a body which is uh, 300 meter, roughly, something like this. And most comets we see, they are gigantic, like kilometer, 10 kilometer, even 50 kilometer. So this kind of small perturbation, they don't have a huge impact. On the, on the trajectory of the body. But in the case of Oumuamua, we have a very small body which travel into interstellar space for quite a long period of time. So it had this kind of weird structure that you describe, this weird um, pocket of hydrogen, hydrogen basically inside. So I really like this, uh, this explanation because it does describe physically the motion of, uh, of Oumuamua. But we're going to dig a little bit more into this uh, during this discussion, if that's okay. Um, so let's go to, back to the discovery, Olivier, because people of, often ask um, why, um, when exactly we found out that uh, about Oumuamua, and when we, did we realize that it was an important object? Can you give us a, back, a bit of a background, the personal background stories maybe you have for, about this one? Yeah, well, it, it was very early on, I think on the 18th or 19th, that the the team at Panstar realized that the, the the orbit was weird. And so immediately they raised the alarm. And to me, that was a message from my old friend and longtime colleague, Karen Meach, who is usually a very serious person and the emails are, you know, professional mm -hmm. and there you could hear her jump up and down in her email which was like urgent uh, observations needed call me uh, it was extremely so I called her in the middle of the night and she was super excited uh, at the end she told me the story and the the, the word was interstellar so okay that's it uh, this is something that we have been dreaming about for ages. We, we know that our solar system throws comets away from the solar system. And therefore, the neighbors should do the same things. Mm -hmm. So we expect comets to come in to come in our way. So we have been expecting interstellar comets forever. And now there is one. So the first thing was to secure telescopes. And as the object was extremely faint, that means big telescope, which is good because I happen to work on a big telescope. So uh, the, we went through the whole procedure to get to secure telescope time in record time. I mean, the, yeah. the proposal was written during the night, submitted in the morning, approved at midday, and on the evening we were observing. And so we started to get more data. We started to see, yep, it's reddish. Uh, no, it does not have a tail. And yes, the, the brightness change 
dramatically. So it, that means that on the first night, we already knew, okay, this is weird. We were expecting a comet, and this does not look like a comet at all. It is something completely different. So to make the story short, we observed as much as we could on all the telescopes we could get our hands on. Uh, the object was moving away very fast, so we knew that we had very, very little time before even the big telescope could not reach it. And so that's what we got. We got the variability, we got the color, we got the lack of cometary activity. I mean, you, it really looks like a dot, and we, we really looked as deep as we could. And then we started to try to understand and to get all the, everything that we could. Then after about one month, our friends doing the astrometry, so measuring the position very, very carefully and computing the orbit, started to get nervous because the orbit was misbehaving. Mm -hmm. and so that was really the, the last thing is that not only the, this object looks really weird, but also the orbit behaves very weirdly. So we tried to model the, 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 the cometary activity, but let's put it that way. Our models are not as advanced as what Jenny has done. So we reached a point to say, yeah, it looks plausible, but we could not go further. Yeah, and yeah. I just, I, I just want to, I just want to be able to understand that when you say large telescope, we're talking about eight, ten meter diameter telescopes, right? To be able yeah, to, to detect it, and there is yeah, not that many large. in the world. There is like a dozen of them, or maybe yeah, something like that, right? So yes, when the object was discovered, I mean, the amount of telescope time was extremely limited, so the science you could do was limited as well. You, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You want to finish this? This, this. No, I'm I'm done. Yes, but you, yeah. you you're right. And the the last image that we got was with Hubble, uh, and that was really at the limit. So we we tracked it all as long as we could before we we lost it, and we will never ever observe it again because it's gone. Yeah. It's gone. It will never come back. I have a more or less similar question for you, Jenny. So you're a chemist. Okay, you're a weird species for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love chemistry, but now I love it. I didn't like it at school. So how did you get interested in this body? How this come out? Do you have a kind of what? Uh, generally, we have a story, like you meet someone, what happened? Why, why suddenly you got interested in Umuamua? Yeah, so I am an astrochemist by training, so I I study the chemistry specific to regions of space where stars and planets are forming, and I'm interested in how the chemistry sort of shapes the outcomes of planet and planetesimal formation. So a, a lot of what we try to compare to is to solar system comets, which are sort of the pristine relics left over from when our solar system was forming, and so we can learn quite a bit about planet formation chemistry in general by looking at solar system comets. So I think from a sort of layperson's view, I was really excited when Oumuamua was discovered, but I didn't become like personally that interested in it until um, the some of the explanations started coming out trying to explain the composition of Oumuamua. And that got me really interested when there started to be these sort of um, exotic kinds of planetesimals that they were saying had to exist to explain its acceleration. Um, and I, I think just the implications that that would have for how, how planet formation takes place and so forth really kind of piqued my interest. Um, and a lot of this was kicked off by meeting my co-author, Daryl Seligman, who is, um, has done a, a tremendous amount of work on Oumuamua before we met and started talking about this um, and really got me interested in the problem. All right. So um, a question about your modeling. Do you do experiments in the lab to confirm this? Or how, do you, how does that work concretely? Yeah, so the premise that we are proposing is really grounded in lab experiments. And actually, I was originally planning to do these experiments, but I was looking through the literature and there's so much um, that's been done already looking at hydrogen formation through water irradiation over the past 
like four or five decades, really. So a lot of people, for various reasons, are interested in what happens to water ice when you irradiate it. Um, so it turned out that we didn't actually need to do any new experiments to kind of provide enough support that this me mechanism could work. Um, but but yeah, it was pretty mind blowing looking through some of the literature back in like the 80s or something, people were suggesting that comets should have hydrogen coma based on this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And it got kind of forgotten, I guess, <laughs> until we really needed it to explain this behavior. Yeah, that's the way science works. There is yeah. people write obscure paper that we never use and we never care about. And then suddenly mm -hmm. something happens and say, oh, we go back to the literature and say, oh, someone thought about that already. That's yeah. Great. Um, we are running short on time, so I'm going to ask you more qu more questions, but I would like you to answer like very shortly if that's possible. I'm sorry, but I wanted to have, to have the time to take some questions from the viewers. We have more than 300 people watching us right now, so we're probably going to have a lot of questions. Um, Olivier, um, so we have detected Oumuamua in 2017. There is another one we detected after in 2019 that was Borisov, if I remember. Um, we're going to go back to this one, but tell us a bit, like, what's, uh, how are we going to detect more Oumuamua-like objects in the future? What do you think is going to happen? Well, the, the trick is to survey the whole sky as often as you can and to check for everything that's moving. And the good news is that a telescope is being built right now. It should be ready very soon. It's the Vera Rubin Observatory with the LSST Large Synoptic Survey uh, Telescope. No, it's not telescope anymore, LSST. And that telescope is an eight meter, so same class as my VLT, except it's equipped with a huge camera that will survey, that will take images of a large chunk of, size, of sky at every time and then compare with the previous image and the telescope is so big and they are going to survey so much of the sky that all the everything is going to be spotted so all the normal comets asteroids are going to be seen but also if there is an interstellar object uh, as small as Oumuamua they will catch it so it's quite possible that there are interstellar objects traveling across the solar system all the time. But Oumuamua was really at the limit of what we could detect at that mm -hmm. time. Had it been a little bit smaller or a little bit further away, we would have missed it. And so what we hope is that with LSST, we will get many more. How many? You know, we're doing statistics on two objects which is much better because before we were doing statistics on one or on zero objects. And so let's say something like one per year is reasonable. All right. One or two a year, you said? Yeah, something like that. All right. You know, Absolutely. for astronomers, one per year means something between 10 per year and one every 10 year, but yeah. <laughs> of, of that order, yes. All right. So that's a good transition for my next question for Jenny. So imagine now we just detect one of these uh, interloper or interstellar messenger once a year. What experiment or what additional observations now we are ready that will help confirming ambiguously you type your modeling? You have an yeah. idea? Definitely. So I think one of the nice things about our model is that it should be generic. So like I said, we should be forming hydrogen in any icy body that's exposed to radiation. So either in solar system comets that live really far from the sun or in future interstellar objects, we can look for signatures either of um, non-gravitational acceleration when the object is too far from the sun to expect other things to be outgassing, mm -hmm. or we can also look kind of directly for signatures of hydrogen gas coming off of them. So even though Oumuamua is long gone, hopefully we can still test whether this mechanism can explain it with other objects. And then on the experimental side, I think kind of trying to better quantify how efficiently you produce hydrogen from different types of radiation and different compositions of ices will also help us to kind of um, uh, nail down the modeling side a little bit better. 
Olivier, you wanted to add something about that? Yeah, the, the, there is something really weird. We know two interstellar objects. One of them is Oumuamua, super strange. The other one, Borisov, is absolutely normal. This is what we expected. I mean, it behaves like a comet, it looks like a comet. So that's really what we were expecting. So currently, one and one. When we will have 100 of these objects, will we, will, will we have one Oumuamua and 99 comet like Borisov? Mm -hmm. In that case, it would be super exciting. Or will we get many more that come like Oumuamua? And then in that case, Jenny's theory will be tested to success, I hope. I am confident. Yeah. Uh, and that will be even more exciting because these objects are so weird that they ask more questions than the answer. So we need to discover more. We need to discover more. We need more data. That's the conclusion of every <laughs> talk in science, right? But <laughs> but that's uh, that's a good point. Um, so, do you think we are now ready for a visit of a new interplanetary messenger? Like, are we? Like when I say ready, do you think we have all the experiment and all the analysis that or the instrument we will need to to uh, to better quantify what those are and where they're coming from? Is there anything that we could do better than just looking through a telescope, for instance? Okay, I start from the observer point of view, Jen, then Jenny from the chemist's point of view. We are much better than a few years ago because now our detection pipelines have been fine-tuned so that we don't miss them because the LSST is coming and will be ready to detect many of them because we are building the next generation of telescopes. Currently, the biggest telescope is 8 to 10 meter. We are building telescopes from 20 to 40 meters, so you know. Mm -hmm even bigger, so we would be able to study in much more details, even Oumuamua, if, it would, if another one would come back. And then the excitement for Oumuamua was so strong that astronomers managed to convince a space agency to build a spacecraft to go and visit one. It's the European uh, Space Agency Comet Interceptor. So basically it's a spacecraft that is being built and that is being launched and then it will wait. It will wait for an object to arrive. So we hope that an interstellar object will arrive and then that spacecraft will be sent to it. If nothing comes, then they will send it to a long period comet, which yeah. will also be exciting because we've never seen one up close. But the, the fact that we have a spacecraft basically ready, ready to go and to be launched at the next interstellar object is yeah, completely new. Incredible. That's that's a, that's a new, that's a change of, of paradigm. Yeah, definitely. We have never done that, building a spacecraft that will wait basically for the science to happen or to, for the target to appear. That's yeah. pretty interesting that we managed to convince the European Space Agency to do something like this. What about you, Jenny? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think some sort of interceptor mission would be sort of the gold standard in terms of what we could learn about these kinds of objects. So it's really exciting that something like that could happen. Um, I guess from the chemical side, I mean, even with respect to solar system comets, there's still a lot that we don't understand about like the interactions between the dust and the ice in the comet and how the outgassing is actually happening. So I think that yeah, trying to bolster our understanding of cometary behavior um, from the, the lab angle will also hopefully help us to interpret things that come by in the future. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna take some questions from the from our viewers. Uh, as I, I see a lot of excitement already on the Q&A. So we selected a few questions. Thank you very much, Simon and Rebecca for doing this. Um, so one of the questions, uh, there is a lot of them, yes, way more than I expected. So um, can you tell us anything about the age of Oumuamua or its birth or origins? So maybe we can start with the, 
one of you, Jenny or Olivier, who wants to take this question? Do we know where it's coming from? Do we know how much, how all these things is? Not well, it turns out. So I think dating interstellar objects is sort of a statistical game. Um, so you can look at sort of how fast it's moving relative to the sun. There's uncertainties on how fast the sun is moving relative to things around us. So I think the, the number that you see in the literature is often like order 100 million years, but that's yeah. there's a big, big error bar on that. Um, I think people are pretty confident that a muamua is younger than Borisov, but that's sort of as strong of a claim as you could make. Okay. Do you want to add something, Olivier, about this? Yeah, in terms of where it's coming from, we tried to roll back the orbit into the past and to see if it was passing close to a star. Uh, it's tricky because stars are moving and we're talking 100 million years. That means that the whole galaxy turned a few times during that time. So everything, the, the motion of the stars is really complex. Short version is we have a some candidates, but nothing, nothing serious. So we don't, we don't know where it's coming from. Okay. Um, thank you. And other questions. Um, how much data is left to analyze about this body? I mean, you mentioned that there is multiple telescopes to observe it, the space telescopes as well. Is there any chance we get more insights about this, the nature of this body, in the next year, or would you have to, do we have to wait for the next visitor? Okay, all the data has been analyzed to death. Okay. So, yeah, there is not one for You can give us short answer, we find. Yes, <laughs> but that means that exactly what happened with Jenny, we looked at the data, we tried our best, and we reached to a certain point, and then someone else comes with new ideas and look at the data and go further. So that's something that can be done, but in terms of there will, be, there will be no more data. And so that means it's a matter of trying to squeeze more of out of the existing data. Okay. Uh, short answer. Jenny, question for you maybe. Can anything be deduced from the object's red color? Is there anything chemist chemistry related here from the reddish color? Yeah, so the reddening is something that you often see in solar system bodies that are have been processed a lot. And so it sort of fits with the scenario that we think of. You'd have like a really kind of irradiated processed crust on the very surface layer of the body that would give it the reddish color. Okay. Um, I have a question for you, Olivier. I'm sorry, I'm going to assign the questions now, so it's going to be faster. Uh, can we send a probe? to catch up to Oumuamua? Uh, this has been considered. Uh, basically, the engineers went to the warehouse and see, okay, can we assemble a spacecraft super quick and then uh, put it on a rocket? Uh, the, the answer at the end was no. It was too short time and moving too fast. Okay. Um... Rebecca and Simon, I think we can have, we can take a few more questions if you have any. Um, okay. How about, what about the hypothesis that is an alien artifact? Who wants to take this question? I know there's a lot of questions related to that. So okay. maybe both I, of I you, can, Olivia, you start. I can start. Okay. You can always explain almost everything with aliens or dragons or angels. If you don't know the answer of the story, you can say, okay, th there is something magic th that will solve it. And that will always work by definition. So yes, of course it can be uh, an alien spacecraft. Yes, uh, but if you look at almost anything that you don't know what it is, you can say, yeah, 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 this is a super advanced technology. The point is we do not need that kind of magic to deal with Oumuamua. We observed it and all the observations, even now the non-gravitational orbit, are 
explained with something that we understand. It is explained by saying it's it's a comet. It's a slightly weird comet. It has this uh, hydrogen sublimation. And so that means that this is a very reasonable, very simple explanation that, uh, that uses only things that we know about for sure. So we don't need aliens. But if you want to believe, there is, it's an act of faith. It's not uh, a scientific decision anymore. If there is a simple explanation, use it. Don't, you don't need magic. All right, that's a very good answer. <laughs> so Jenny, do you want to add something about that topic? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I agree with what Ali said. I think when we want to invoke things like aliens, we should have a, a high burden of proof that for, like arguing in favor of that and not just sort of an absence of evidence for something else. So I think we should be open-minded about discovering life elsewhere, as I'm sure a lot of people at the SETI Institute are enthusiastic about, but we should we should be very scientific about how we're doing it. Yeah. For instance, at the SETI Institute, we listen to uh, bodies like that. I mean, mm -hmm. just check if there is techno signatures coming from them. It has mm -hmm. been done. We're not ignoring it. We try. It's an experiment. It's part of the it's part of science to also consider this hypothesis. But as you mentioned, Olivier, we have now a good explanation for most of the characteristics of Oumuamua without having to invoke aliens. So logically, we don't need aliens to explain the to explain Oumuamua. And of course, my dog is making a lot of noise in the back. <laughs> I don't know why. Anyway. Uh, let's continue. One question that we have, I have this question multiple times. What is, um, is it possible to observe Oumuamua with JWST and maybe to get some information about Oumuamua at posteriori or is it too faint? Too faint. It's gone. It's gone. Okay. Um, oh, a clarification. Someone asked, how do we know this is the first interstellar uh, body? Uh, did we miss a lot of them? So I just, I'm going to answer to this one. When we say it's the first one, we mean the first one which has been detected and seen. It doesn't mean that this is the first one passing through the solar system. As you mentioned, Olivier, already, we, uh, we believe that there is a lot of them passing by. And with LSST, we expect to detect once, statistically once per year uh, in the future. So this is not the first one. It's the first one detected and characterized. That's what we meant. Um, I think we are good with the questions. I have one question for, oh, now I have an interesting one here. Um, is there any, in the future development of ground-based telescopes, um, will it be possible to, uh, are we using AI-based technology to detect and characterize those objects? Do you know a bit about the algorithm that's going to be used at, with LSST, for instance, and those other large surveys? OK. What I know is that it's fairly simple. Basically, you compare two images and you look what is the difference. So whether it will be made better by AI, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Until now, we have never had to use it because plain good old algorithms work pretty well. But AI is so powerful that maybe it will help. I don't know. Okay. Um, one question for you, Jenny. Uh, someone asked if the big variation we see in the light curve could be instead of being due to the physical dimension, could be due to some kind of variation of albedo on the surface of, uh, of Oumuamua. Do you have uh, some ideas about that? Um, I, at first thought, it seems like that's plausible. But Ali, do you have additional kind of insight? Well, actually, we tried. And no, it does not work. You, you need something so weird and you, you don't reproduce the sharp the sharp dips of the light curve. Yes. So it does not work. Okay. And do we have any um 
Any idea of the extreme shape of Umuamua, where it's coming from? Is that due to the formation of the body or is it due to the long travel? Or what's the, what's the hypothesis we have for this, for this extreme shape? Yeah, I've seen both, <laughs> um, both formation and sort of stripping away of the surface layers as explanations for the weird shape. I don't think that we know for sure. Um, that's a, a hard question to answer. Olivier, do you want to add something about this? There the, are the many hypotheses, but nothing conclusive. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions so related to that. What about Borisov? This Boris, did Borisov have Borisov the same shape, extreme shape, or was it more like a normal comet? Or we don't normal know? comet, yes. The, it's quite active, so that means that uh, it's surrounded by dust, so we don't really see the nucleus. But from the, the data we have, it is slightly elongated, but nothing dramatic, All right. just like a comet. Okay, I think that's going to be one of the last questions. It's also for, for the chemist. So if hydro hydrogen is being expelled, what happened to the oxygen in the in the comet? Is it being expelled later on? What's or it stays there? What happened? Yeah, so we don't know for sure, but um, sort of the two scenarios you could imagine, you may make things like molecular oxygen or hydrogen peroxide that remain trapped within the water structure. Um, or those may outgas as well. But ultimately, if they were outgassing, that would just mean that you need less hydrogen produced in the first place. We don't have any spectroscopic constraints on things like water or oxygen or hydrogen peroxide that would rule out that that was also outgassing. All right. Okay, uh, I'm looking if there is more questions uh, really that we can take that we did not answer yet, but I think we have discussed almost everything related to future telescopes and so on. So I have a question for you, in fact, before we uh, we part away. Um, so you have been working on the field, which is, I mean, a new discovery, quite remarkable. Um, what are going to be your next involvement in the next 10 years? What you believe is going to happen and how are you going to be uh, using your skills or what you learn from Umuamua in the future? I'm going to start with Jenny, if you're okay. Yeah, so I think I'm really excited about, like I said before, trying to do a better job through experimental studies of understanding the behavior of volatiles and dust in these sort of extreme comet-like conditions that we really don't have strong intuition for based on the environment that we have here on Earth. So I think the experimental side is definitely going to be important. Um, the other thing that you could sort of complement this with is um, observations of planet forming environments and systems around other stars. We can learn about the composition of, of volatiles in these other systems. And in principle, that's where these interstellar comets are coming from. So mm -hmm. we can help to sort of, similar to how we look at solar system comets to understand the composition of the solar system as it was forming, we can sort of pair observations of um, protoplanetary disks with interstellar comets to learn about planet formation chemistry in general. Nice, I like that answer. What about you, Olivier? Okay. Soon, really soon, we will have the new generation of telescopes. And these new telescopes will be so much more powerful than anything we have ever had, that most likely all the questions that, that we use to justify building these telescopes will be answered quickly. And then there will be a whole there will be truckloads of new discoveries, things that we have no clue today. We have absolutely no idea what we are going to discover. And I think that is, that is going to be extremely exciting. And to, to be just a little bit more specific, I think that with these new telescopes, we will be able to study other solar systems in a little, a little bit better in the way that we study our solar system. And so that we will be able to compare extrasolar planets with our planets and who knows extrasolar comets with our comets. Mm -hmm. So I think that there will be really a, 
a new a new era and starting in five years from now yeah so what we have done over the past 20, 30 years is to study our solar system, the sun in the comet, the asteroid, and so on. And you see that in the future, with this population of interstellar body, we're going to be able to understand other planetary systems, detect planets. We know how to do that, exoplanets. We know how to do this. But now, with those pieces coming from those planetary systems, we'll be able to better understand those planetary systems, take samples maybe in the future of interstellar objects. So see how other planetary systems are different or identical to ours. That's an exciting time for us, for astronomers, and in fact, for more than astronomers. Understanding how the planetary system form is going to change definitely the way we see our place in the universe. So thank you very much to both of you for this time. I really love this uh, discussion on Oumuamua. Thank you, Jenny, for taking the time to come to uh, speak to us about chemistry and make it up fun and interesting, really appreciate. Thank you, Olivier, for uh, coming, uh, for staying late from Europe to talk to us about the progress in uh, the next generation of telescopes. Um, I think it's an exciting time and we are going to have talks on that in the future about the ELT and others. So I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and uh, I hope we're gonna stay in contact to talk about the next Oumuamua. The next, I don't know how it's gonna be called. Maybe it's gonna be called. It's gonna be called the Eno. Maybe you're gonna find this one, Olivier. Or maybe. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, to all of our viewers, thank you very much. I have a special message here because uh, this is the end of our SETI talks under this format. I will say um, we are discussing at the moment what we're gonna do in the future. Um, I remind you, we started this in 2018. I remember I've organized the first kind of panel discussion on, set, on, set, on for city talks instead of having one, one speaker. And interestingly, the speaker was Mattia Chuck and Meg Schwang, and they talk about what? Moi, moi. <laughs> so in the end, five years later, they talk about the discovery, they talk about the, the non-gravitational motion and so on. And five years, six, five years later, even more, uh, five years later, yes, we uh, we have kind of another talk where we have kind of an answer on the weird behavior of Umuamu. So it's um, it's been an interesting journey to organize those talks uh, to to with my colleagues. I just mentioned that just Rasmin's been helping, Bess, Lee. Uh, Simon, who is here, and of course, under the leadership of Rebecca McDonald, our director of communication. So we will go back, another format, another style. We don't know yet. Um, I will be involved. Uh, other people will be involved, new faces, hopefully. And uh, yeah, we, the hope is to bring more science and uh, and the fun of science and exploration to all of you everywhere in the, in the world. So thanks again, and uh, see you soon. And Simon is all, all yours. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, uh, as this is a SETI Institute talk, we had to mention the possibility of alien artifacts. And, but uh, what this shows, of course, is the importance of whatever comes into our solar system. Uh, we need a very vigorous and rigorous scientific investigation of that object to find out exactly its uh, its structure, its origins, and, and its relevance to, to uh, uh, the universe. Um, so... Actually, leaving the last words to um, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, bringing it back to Rendezvous with Rama, there's a wonderful last line in it um, that the Ramans do everything in threes. And so we hope uh, that the truth will live up to um, uh, fiction and we will get another object coming through very, very shortly. Um, I want to thank our speakers, Jenny, Olivier, thank Frank. Um, we had uh, people tuning in from all over the world. They're just Got a short list here, Minneapolis, New York, Coventry in the UK, Bruges, Los Altos, just up the road, Brazil, Mexico City, Normandy, Bucharest, Venezuela, um, and Australia, to name just a few origins of uh, the people tuning in. Um, thank you so much. Uh, a reminder that the SETI Institute is a nonprofit organization, and we do rely on, on a lot of donations uh, to keep us ticking over. And if you're interested in sponsoring uh, SETI Talks um, when we reconvene uh, in the fall, uh, please drop us an email, uh, community at SETI.org, and you can find out more details about what the SETI Institute is doing by going to our website, uh, SETI.org. Thank you again to the speakers. Thank you all for tuning in, and we will see you again soon.
Take care.